Welcome to the Writer's Rendezvous from the South Dakota Humanities Council. Hello, I'm Carl Gerke of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. I'm here at the Deadwood Mountain Grand for the 2013 South Dakota Festival of Books, and my guest is Andrew Nicky Fork, author of a number of books dealing with energy and economics, including The Tar Sands, Empire of the Beetle, and the latest one is The Energy of Slaves. And Andrew, welcome. Thanks for joining us. It's a great pleasure to be here. Now, these, these books, what is it that they all have in common? They, they all deal with the environment, obviously, but beyond that, is there is there a broader theme? Uh, I guess the, the broader, broader theme would be the abuse of uh, natural resources in one, one way or another, as well as our, uh, our real abuse um, of energy and how we use energy. Now that's the, the, the topic of, of really the new book, The Energy of Slaves. I'm interested in, in the metaphor that, that you use in this book, which is slaves and, and energy. Well, much to uh, my surprise, energy, uh, slavery uh, was truly an energy institution, and it is one of our first experiences with energy as an institution. And we used shackled muscle, human muscle, to get work done so other people could be comfortable. And um, uh, the Romans did this, the Greeks did this, the Babylonians did this, of course the Americans did this as well. And, uh, and this was a horrific trade but the ancients, ref you know, they, they talked about slavery uh, or slaves as speaking tools. Now, they, they saw them as instruments. They saw them as technologies to help them get work done the same way we view our car, we view our iPod, our washing machine, our dishwasher. And so we took that thinking that is largely derived from uh, the master-slave experience, and then we substituted that uh, with hydrocarbons, as a cheap source of fuel for um, energy slaves, which are all the machines and gadgets we use today, whether we're talking about combustion engines or whether we're talking about digital equipment that is multiplying in our home and providing us with all kinds of comforts. And the result is always the same. I mean, when you have cheap energy and too much of it and you abuse it, uh, slavery was a massive form of abuse, but if people now we're massively abusing all kinds of energy slaves and also the, the fuel stocks that feed them. Uh, you get a very fat and lazy population, and um, which was very much an issue, let's say, for southern plantation ish, uh, owners in the United States. They realized they had lost a lot of their freedom because caring for an enormous number of slaves took a lot of time. Uh, they were concerned about their spiritual welfare um, as a consequence of, 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 the, of, of being slave owners. And we have many of the same issues today, that, and, but we are reluctant to, to face them straight on for what they are. You know, the great Catholic theologian, Ivan Illich, raised the question, how many energy slaves do you really need? And he was one of the first to come up with the observation that the more energy slaves a society has, the more complex it will become and the less free it will be as a result. It will be a socially engineered place, not, not a place of free men and free women. One of the interesting points that you bring up in the energy of slaves is uh, because there were, we had slavery to do the work, we had slaves to do our work, that, that sort of prevented the advancement of technology, for example, uh, the steam engine that, that that's right. maybe, uh, what, a thousand years did you, did you write? Yeah, that's right, for exactly. And, and the issue there wasn't, 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 it wasn't the fact that it was slavery, it was the fact that it was a cheap form of energy. Like in Rome, I mean, you could, you could, you know, uh, send the Roman army off to France and capture 70,000 Gauls and bring them back, put them up for sale. That was cheap energy. Or you could go to North Africa and, again, that was cheap energy. It became expensive energy when you ran out of places to conquer and when the people you wanted to conquer uh, started to fight back, whether they're Germanic tribes or the Celtic tribes in northern Scotland. And then your source of energy becomes expensive and then the whole system you know, uh, uh, falls apart. But societies employing cheap energy don't, are, 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 aren't as innovative as societies th uh, for, for whom energy is scarce. So are we at the point? So you go to the Middle East, you, f yeah. you don't find a lot of technological innovation taking place in the Middle East, right? You don't find a lot of technical innovation even taking place in, 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 uh, uh, like Canada, which are so heavily dependent on the extraction of cheap resources. So does this, what does this mean now that we're, we have all this cheap uh, fuel, at least right now, anyway? Well, I make the argument that, that we, we we're, we've run out of the, cheap, run out of the cheap stuff. We've run out of the cheap stuff. Now we're in a crunch because now we're, we're hitting 
these difficult extreme hydrocarbons, whether it's shale gas or bitumen or shale oil, and the cost of oil is going up, it means it costs more and more to keep our energy slaves going, and which means that we are going to have to destroy more environments and uh, create an ever more complex society to somehow uh, play catch up here. And, uh, and we're failing to do that. And as, as, as energy becomes more expensive, we are going to see more and more economic stagnation and political instability. And that's gonna be a huge problem for us. So there's, you don't see a situation where we can, we can remedy this problem or, or, or stop it and start thinking in different, in different ways? And, uh, well, as as okay, energy. the Romans never had an intelligent conversation about slavery mm -hmm. and, its, and, its, and its weaknesses and, and, and how they needed to get off of it. They didn't have that conversation. We're having real difficulty having a conversation even about the emissions of our energy slaves and, and the impact on climate change. Um, the, um, the great uh, U.S. anthropologist Joseph Tainter from New Mexico makes the point he doesn't think we'll get off fossil fuels until we are forced to. And I think he's probably right. Is that the way it will work when we're dealing with other environmental concerns, uh, for example, rising seas and uh, It will take a series of catastrophic mm -hmm. events to, be, to really force us into uh, some pretty critical and dramatic adaptations. Um, because we have had all the warnings, we know the science. Uh, it's, it's pretty clear that we're 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 in for some turbulent waters here, um, and that we're going to have trouble keeping the canoe in the water. And in fact, we might then well tip the canoe. Uh, but knowing all that, it will take a tipping to to get us really thinking seriously about how we change the way we live and how we change uh, the way we we employ energy to get stuff done for us. So this, this is not a very optimistic picture that you're painting. Well, I'm not, it's not so much optimistic. I'm, I'm painting, uh, no, it's not optimistic. It is a realistic picture of how real change takes place. And then you add uh, a, a whole element of unpredictability and uncertainty to, to this uh, uh, picture. And, and that's where we're heading. And uh, I, you know, the future is not written. We will write the future in one way or another. Um, and so it, it's up to us to determine if, if, if we're going to tip the canoe or not. Does it, does it always have to be like that, that, uh, that you, it, we have to reach the critical? Most civilizations have reached a, a critical tipping points um, where they have gone beyond certain thresholds, where they have stretched the boundaries to the nth degree. And at that point, you either face collapse or you face major change. And that's where we're going. Do you see any places currently in, in the world where that is, that is happening? I think both Japan, the United States, uh, uh, and Europe are all facing dramatic uh, economic stagnation as their energy spending is going down due to increasing energy costs. Um, we're also seeing rising uh, political instability in Europe, uh, parts of the United States and Japan as well as a consequence. So we, we are beginning to see uh, that a transition is taking place, um, and and probably within the next five to ten years, we're gonna we're gonna reach a lot of tipping points where we're gonna see very rapid, dramatic, unpredictable change, and 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 very radical reactions to some of these changes. Well, Andrew Nicky Fork, thanks so much for taking the time to uh, talk with us. Thank you, Carl. It's been a pleasure. Writers Rendezvous is a production of SDPV.